Section 9 of The Ring and the Book, An Interpretation, by Francis Bickford Hornbrook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9. Dominus Hyacinthus de Archangelis. Heretofore, we have listened to the voices of those who have spoken out of their prejudices, their love or hate, their hope or fear. They have all been animated by personal interest or feeling. But in the speeches of the lawyers, only a professional interest in the story appears. Hyacinthus de Archangelis, who has been appointed to defend Guido and his four companions, intends to base his defence on certain abstract principles of law and honour. He knows that he cannot evade the charge of murder, or, as he prefers to phrase it, of the killing. Unfortunately, Guido had been unable to endure the torture and had made confession of his deed. Otherwise, he could have proved the murder a mere myth. He could have urged that Guido, at the time of its commission, was visiting his proper church, the duty of us all at Christmas time, when Caponsacchi, the seducer, stung to madness by his relegation, cast about him and contrived a remedy in murder. Since opprobrium broke afresh, by birth of the babe, on him, the imputed sire, he it was quietly sought to smother up his shame and theirs together, killed the three, and fled. Go seek him where you please to search. Just at the time when Guido, touched by grace, devotions ended, hastened to the spot, meaning to pardon his convicted wife. Neither do I condemn thee. Go in peace. And thus arrived, in the nick of time to catch the charge of the killing, though great-heartedly he came but to forgive and bring to life. Doubt ye the force of Christmas on the soul? Is thine eye evil, because mine is good? But now that Count Guido, not being able to bear pain, has confessed his deed, this plea would not answer, and he must find other means to extenuate, or perhaps justify it. He contends, therefore, that he finds excuse on the ground that Guido's honour had been threatened, and that, in defence of that alone, he had killed Pompilia and those with her. Therefore we shall demonstrate, first of all, that honour is a gift of God to man precious beyond compare, which natural sense of human rectitude and purity, which white man's soul is born with, brooks no touch. Therefore, the sensitivest spot of all, wounded by any wafture breathed from black, is, honour within honour, like the eye centred i' the ball, the honour of our wife. Touch us to the pupil of our honour, then, not actually, since so you slay outright, but by a gesture simulating touch, presumable mere menace of such taint, this were our warrant for eruptive ire, to whose dominion I impose no end. Having laid down the abstract principle, de Archangelis proceeds to illustrate its truth. He quotes a passage from Theodoric, refers to the chaste bees, and tells an interesting story of an elephant which had rebuked the dishonour done to his master by trampling the guilty wife and her paramour to death. Then, mounting from beast to man, he cites the Athenian code and Roman laws of different periods, such as those of Romulus, Julian, Cornelius, and Gracchus, and endeavours to show how, even before the perfect revelation had been made, these had proclaimed the right of the injured husband to avenge his threatened honour by the shedding of blood. Grace emphasised what nature had revealed. All that was long ago declared as law by the natural revelation stands confirmed by apostle and evangelist and saint, to wit, that honour is man's supreme good. To the proof and elucidation of this he brings forward passages from St. Jerome, St. Gregory, St. Bernard, and Solomon. He finds in Samson an antitype of Guido, who, he says, bore all evils, 
jives stripes and daily labour at the mill but drew the temple down and killed his foes when his sense of honour was stirred by being brought out as an object of sport even in the words of our lord himself he claims to find a proof of the justice of his plea and a reason for the acquittal of guido because he said my honour i give to no man if a man must defend his honour and the old law that punished the adulterous wife with stoning has been abolished primitive revenge must take its place it is now a man's duty to use his natural privilege and this not only nature but the social sentiment demands it is not a cause which must wait the decision of a court it demands prompt and immediate action courts were not intended to punish such offences or to determine in such matters the measure of innocence or guilt the husband must defend his own honour but if this be so why does the court find it necessary to condemn guido at all simply because it was improperly done a good thing done unhandsomely turns ill in proof of this de archangelis cites of sicily's decisions sixty first then the learned lawyer seeks to explain why guido killed three instead of one and refers to cases in ancient history which whether they justify guido or not show that his lawyer was a man of great erudition now the question presses why did guido procrastinate his revenge why did he do in cold blood that which he failed to do when his blood was hot to argue in this way de archangelis claims shows ignorance of the way in which honour bears a wound this time makes it harder to bear longer the sufferance stronger grows the pain murder ought to be avenged at once but this is more like the punishment of a theft which one can inflict whenever and wherever he finds the thing stolen in the hands of the thief but guido had waited a week after he arrived in rome on his mission of revenge it may be urged to this de archangelis replies with an outburst of apparently religious indignation is no religion left no care for aught held holy by the church what would you have us skip and miss those feasts of the natal time must we go prosecute secular business on a sacred day six aggravations of the crime urged by the prosecution are all adroitly explained away and treated as of no consequence because no crime being committed there can be no aggravation of it fisk how often must i round thee in the ears all means are lawful to a lawful end concede he had the right to kill his wife the count indulged in a travesty why de illa ut vindictam sumeret that on her he might lawful vengeance take commodius with more ease et tutius and safelier de archangelis then justifies guido for hiring others to help him commit the killing they could not understand reasons of honour we must he contends translate our motives like our speech into the lower phrase that suits the sense of the limitedly apprehensive with this he ends the defence of guido and denotes a few contemptuous plausible passages to the defence of his hirelings it is true he says that they afterwards intended to kill guido for merely neglecting to pay them but that again showed his cultivated mind he would not desecrate the deed nor vulgarize justice by defraying its cost by money dug out of the dirty earth what though he lured base hinds by lucas hope the only motive they could masticate milk for babes not strong meat which men require the deed done those coarse hands were soiled enough he spared them the pollution of the pay the lawyers in the ring and the book add nothing to our knowledge of the tragedy which they have been called upon to consider their whole endeavour is to make speeches which will produce an effect upon the judges and which above all will add to their own reputation for learning and special pleading there is not a trace of insight in all they say their formulas of law 
obscure their vision of reality. But little as they tell us of the facts of the case, they tell us much of themselves. In and through their pleadings, and in and through the processes of their minds, as they prepare them, we learn what manner of men they are. They unconsciously reveal the secrets of their own hearts. We see Diacangelis in his study, preparing his argument in defence of Guido. We hear him speak, and we know at once that he is a fond father, and that love for his boy and desire for his welfare are motives that animate his efforts. Evidently, he has very little interest in his case, and his mind works upon it mechanically. But the thought of what he may do for his boy frees him, for a time, from the seductions of sluggishness and appetite. This speech will help his boy in his future career, and for that he will work with all the might that is in him. We'll beat you, my Botinius, all for love, all for our tribute to Chinotto's day. The supper he is to give on this, his son's birthday, will, he hopes, win the favour of the grandfather, and he plans how he may gain bequests for the boy from the other relatives. He is a man of domestic temper who loves the enjoyments of home, and these have power to console him for the loss of the office which Bortinius, his rival, had gained. Well, let others climb the heights of the court, the camp. How vain are chambering and wantonness, revel and rout and pleasures that make mad. Commend me to home joy, the family board, altar and hearth. These, with a brisk career, a source of honest profit and good fame, just so much work as keeps the brain from rust, just so much play as lets the heart expand, honouring God and serving man. I say, these are reality, and all else, fluff. Nutshell and naught, thank Flaccus for the phrase. Suppose I had been Fisk, yet bachelor. He is very fond of a good meal, and the expectation of a birthday feast in the evening, again and again, interrupts the construction of his plea. Supper and argument, indignation and questions of cookery, mingle in surprising and delightful confusion. He is seeking to mitigate one of the aggravations of his client's offence, and here is the course his mind takes. Yes, here the eruptive wrath with full effect. How, did not indignation chain my tongue, could I repel this last, worst charge of all? There is a porcupine to barbecue. Gigia can jug a rabbit well enough, with sour sweet sauce and pine pips, but, good Lord, suppose the devil instigate the wench to stew, not roast him. Stew, my porcupine? If she does, I know where his quills shall stick. Come, I must go myself and see to things. I cannot stay much longer stewing here. Our stomach, I mean our soul, is stirred within, and we want words. It is easy enough to see that, to Hyacinthus de Archangelis, the soul is a rhetorical phrase, while the stomach is a substantial fact. It is evident, too, that he is shrewd, his eyes always wide open to any chance. The Pope may remember the speech he is making, which will help him to decide the case of Guido, and Rome is full of people now to edify and to give one name and fame. Hyacinthus has sympathy. His own discomfort reminds him of the discomfort of others. As he writes, his fingers grow cold, and so he thinks. Guido must be all goose flesh in his hole, despite the prison straw. Bad carnival for captives. No sliced fry for him, poor Count. I am not aware that he is peculiar in this, for, after all, most of us are sympathetic only when we happen to think of it. His view of providence is somewhat like his sympathy. The horror of the case does not impress him. Providence has allowed the murder to take place just to help him on. Here he is anxious to succeed and to give his boy a good start in life. Now, how good God is! 
how falls plumb to point this murder gives me guido to defend now of all days of the year just when the boy verges on virgil the fact is there's a blessing on the hearth a special providence for fatherhood in this he is neither better nor worse than those who imagine that the universe was constructed for their special advantage and that whatever happens is good because it enables them to make a few more dollars or win a higher place in some social set it is plain that de archangelis has only a professional interest in guido he is far more sorry later that he loses his case than that guido should lose his head and he tries to make up the disappointment to his boy by getting him the pleasure of witnessing the execution intellectually he impresses us as a man of prosaic mind one who worked slowly and who beat out his speeches by patient toil he is not carried along by a train of consecutive thought and chance words very often suggest the cause of his reasoning he mentions a flea and then says talking of which flea reminds me i must put in special word for the poor humble following the four friends sicarii our assassins caught and caged on the whole hyacinthus reveals himself to us as a dull man inclined to be lazy whom the love of his home spurred into activity he is fond of good dinners and his sympathies and views are somewhat contracted he has his little spites and prejudices but on the whole he means well and in this particular case does the best he can for a sorry client end of chapter nine Section 10 of The Ring and the Book, An Interpretation, by Francis Bickford Hornbrook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10. Juris Doctor Johannes Baptista Botinius. When we turn from the speech for the defence to that of the prosecution, we find the same line of subtle, ingenious argumentation running through it. It is based upon an abstract principle which is twisted now this way and now that it suits the purpose of botinius when he is preparing the speech he intends to deliver in court to speak in high praise of pompilia a great theme may my strength be adequate for paint pompilia dares my feebleness how did i unaware engage so much find myself undertaking to produce a faultless nature in a flawless form what's here oh turn aside nor dare the blaze of such a crown such constellation say as jewels here thy front humanity first infancy pellucid as a pearl then childhood stone which dewdrop at the first an old conjecture sucks by dint of gaze blew from the sky and turns to sapphire so yet both these gems eclipsed by last and best womanliness and wifehood opaline its milk-white pallor chastity suffused with here and there a tint and hint of flame desire the lapidary loves to find such jewels bind conspicuously thy brow pompilia infant child maid woman wife crown the ideal in our earth at last what should a faculty like mine do here close eyes or else the rashlier hurry hand he describes pompilia's life from her birth to her marriage and he contends that guido did not forbear as he might have done with the frolicsome girl who had become his wife that he pressed his right as a husband too far it was very unwise if pompilian plaint wrought but to aggravate guidonian ire he thinks he ought to have borne with her all the more because the parents who were the source of all his troubles had left his home he had no cause to make the daily life of pompilia intolerable by his jealousy but he is unreasonable enough prepare 
such loons announced for downright lunacy in sanit homo threat succeeds to threat and blow redoubles blow his wife the block but if a block shall not she jar the hand that buffets her the injurious idle stone rebounds and hits the head of him who flung causeless rage breeds i the wife now rageful cause tyranny wakes rebellion from its sleep rebellion say i rather self-defence laudable wish to live and see good days pricks our pompilia now to fly the fool by any means at any price nay more nay most of all in the very interest of the fool that baffled of his blind desire at any price were truliest victor so shall he effect his crime and lose his soul no dictates duty to a loving wife far better than the unconsummate blow adroitly balked by her should back again correctively admonish his own pate to achieve a good end all efficacious means are allowable now urges Martinius, beauty was all that pompilia had therefore to use it was praiseworthy if she needed some one to serve her what better could she offer to secure him than her love because permit the end permit therewith means to the end all the rest of his speech is a variation upon this theme by ingenious use of it every suspicious circumstance is allowed to be fact and then justified he cites the example of ulysses and venus to excuse pompilia's approaches to caponsacchi and her deceitful wiles what does it matter if she does hold nocturnal meetings with him does every hazel sheath disclose a nut he were a molinist who dared maintain that midnight meetings in a screened alcove must argue folly in a matron to say so would be to cast a slur on judith all these things it is true have been proved false there were no visits to pompilia's house by caponsacchi and there were no nocturnal meetings but for the sake of his argument he allows them to stand as true pompilia is charged with taking money for the expenses of her journey but permit the end permit the means to the end he will allow the truth of the coachman's evidence that the journey was one long embrace what of that admit the end and you admit the means say she kissed him say he kissed her again such osculation was a potent means a very efficacious help no doubt such with a third part of her nectar did venus imbue why should pompilia fling the poet's declaration in his teeth pause to employ what since it had success and kept the priest her servant to the end we must presume of energy enough no whit superfluous so permissible Bartinius justifies pompilia's lie as he allows it to be called about her inability to write as a praiseworthy attempt to repair a wrong hastily done and construes her assertion that she had never learned to write as an act of bravery and he cries oh splendidly mendacious but his opponent will urge that the means used were vile not so since no other means were at hand governor and archbishop had failed her in her hour of need every one waited for a miracle to save her while caponsacchi acted in illustration of this he cites an incident from the jewish sefer todoth yeshu it happened once begins this foolish jew pretending to write christian history that three held greatest best and worst of men peter and john and judas spent a day in toil and travel through the countryside on some sufficient business i suspect suppression of some molinism i the bud footsore and hungry dropping with fatigue they reached by nightfall a poor lonely grange hostel or inn so knocked and entered there your pleasure great ones shelter rest and food for shelter there was one bare room above for rest therein 
three beds of bundled straw. For food, one wretched, starveling fowl, no more. Meat for one mouth, but mockery for three. You have my utmost. How should supper serve? Peter broke silence. To the spit with fowl, and while tis cooking, sleep, since beds there be, and so far, satisfaction of a want. Sleep we an hour, awake at supper time. Then each of us narrate the dream he had, and he whose dream shall prove the happiest, point clearliest out the dreamer, as ordained beyond his fellows to receive the fowl, him let our shares be cheerful tribute to, his the entire meal, may it do him good. Who could dispute so plain a consequence? So said, so done. Each hurried to his straw, slept his hour's sleep, and dreamed his dream, and woke. I, commenced John, dreamed that I gained the prize we all aspire to. The proud place was mine, throughout the earth, and to the end of time. I was the loved disciple, mine the meal. But I, proceeded Peter, dreamed, a word gave me the headship of our company, made me the vicar and vicegerent, gave the keys of heaven and hell into my hand, and all the earth dominion, mine the meal. While I, submitted in soft undertone, the Iscariot, sense of his unworthiness turning each eye up to the inmost white, with long-drawn sigh, yet letting both lips smack, I have had just the pitifullest dream that ever proved man meanest of his mates, and born foot-washer and foot-wiper, nay, foot-kisser to each comrade of you all. I dreamed, I dreamed, and in that mimic dream, impalpable to dream as dream to fact, methought I meanly chose to sleep no wink, but wait until I heard my brethren snore, then stole from couch, slipped noiseless o'er the planks, slid downstairs, furtively approached the hearth, found the fowl duly brown, both back and breast, hissing in harmony with the cricket's chirp, grilled to a point, said no grace but fell to, nor finished till a skeleton lay bare. In penitence for which ignoble dream, lo, I renounce my portion cheerfully. Fie on the flesh! Be mine the ethereal gust, and yours the sublunary sustenance. See that whate'er be left ye give the poor. Down the two scuttled, one on other's heel, stung by a fell surmise, and found, alack, a goodly savour, both the drumstick bones, and that which henceforth took the appropriate name of the merry thought, in memory of the fact that to keep wide awake is man's best dream. Let others shriek, Oh, what refined expedients did we dream proved us the only fit to help the fair? He cried, A carriage waits, jump in with me. Bertinius continues, Guido might have been content with the decision of the court, which really gave him what he ought to have most desired, the justification of his wife. After this vindication of her spotlessness, he should have been ready to welcome her back to his home, and, by so doing, prevent the possible visits of Caponsacchi to the home of her parents, where she was still residing. The birth of a son should have inclined his heart to peace with the mother, and have led him to welcome the little one who might be near the heart of both his parents. Instead of producing that effect, it vexes him all the more. The perverse Guido doubts his eyes, distrusts assurance, lets the devil drive. But, to the last, Pompilia used the right means to the permissible end, and, by a full confession, saved her soul. It then occurs to Bottinius that if this confession is true, it really leaves him nothing to excuse, reason away, or show his skill about. This result he seeks to evade by a resort to technical devices. The confession, he acknowledges, is not to be believed. Still, Pompilia was justifiable in using her dying words to make it easier for the priest Caponsacchi. If that plea will not do, 
then he will maintain that Pompilia confessed before she talked, and so the sacrament obliterates the sin of falsehood. After another legal quibble, Bottinius closes his argument in a way that indicates his perfect satisfaction with it. Thus, Law's son, have I bestowed my filial help, and thus I end, tenax proposito. Point to point, as I purposed, have I drawn Pompilia, and implied as terribly Guido. So, gazing, let the world crown law, able once more, despite my impotence, and helped by the acumen of the court, to eliminate, display, make triumph truth. What other prize than truth were worth the pains? There's my oration. Much exceeds in length that famed panegyric of Isocrates. They say it took him fifteen years to pen. But all those ancients could say anything. He put in just what rushed into his head while I shall have to prune and pare and print. This comes of being born in modern times with priests for auditory. Still, it pays. Potinius does not discover himself to us in so good a light as his opponent. In mental ability he is, no doubt, far superior to De Archangelis. He has great oratorical powers, and nobody knows it better than he. He does not like the custom of presenting pleas in writing. Had I God's leave, how I would alter things. If I might read instead of print my speech, I, an enlivened speech with many a flower, refuses obstinate to blow in print, as wildings planted in a prim parterre. This scurvy room would turn an immense hall. Opposite, fifty judges in a row. This side, and that of me, for audience. Rome, and where yon window is, the Pope should hide, watch, curtained, but peep visibly enough. A buzz of expectation. Through the crowd, jingling his chain and stumping with his staff, up comes an usher, louts him low. The court requires the allocution of the fisc. I rise, I bend, I look about me, pause o'er the hushed multitude. I count. One. Two. He has some poetic feeling and a command of glittering phrases which, to some, may appear to have something substantial in them. He takes great pleasure in his work and has no doubt of its excellence. When he has finished his speech, he is satisfied that it is a masterpiece, something far more difficult to achieve than any that classic orators have handed down. It pays, and he is content he cares more for his speech and his own ingenuity than he cares for his client. In reading the argument of Archangelus for Guido, we feel that he has said about all he could say for him. He employed all the technicalities of pleading because he could do no more. But Bottinius has a client whose confession makes her a martyr and saint. He has no proof that she is not all that she appears to be, and yet he is so possessed with the desire to display his ingenuity that he sets Pompilia's confession aside and defends her as if everything urged against her were true. He has no faith in human nature. He does not know purity and innocence when he sees them. Such a man may do well in defence of a scoundrel, because he can understand him, but innocence puzzles and annoys him. To deceive such a man, one needs only to tell him the truth. His defence of Pompilia is a judgment on his moral obtuseness and a revelation of the inherent nastiness of his nature. For Pompilia to be acquitted on the grounds which he presents would have been to give her legal justification at the expense of moral condemnation. End of chapter 10of The Ring and the Book, an interpretation by Francis Bickford Hornbrook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11. The Pope. We have heard the voices of those who are interested in the story of The Ring and the Book, of those who took part in it, and of the lawyers who pleaded for and against Guido as they happened to be professionally engaged. We now are to hear one speak 
whose attitude toward all the incidents of the story is that of the impartial spectator. The Pope, to whom appeal has been made to rescue Guido, because, having taken some minor orders, he is entitled to the benefit of clergy, is made, by the genius of the poet, to unfold the workings of his mind as he ponders the case of which he is to be the final judge. His meditation consists of three distinct parts. In the first part, the Pope discloses his method of preparing for a decision on important matters. Like Ahasuerus, he turns to the chronicles of the past for instruction and guidance. He reads, in one of them, an account of Formosus, who was made Pope in 891, and of his trial and condemnation after death by his successor, Stephen the Sixth, and he follows also the successive decisions for and against him until John the Ninth in the year 898, exact 800 years ago today, pronounced in his favour. So worked the predecessor, now my turn, in God's name. Once more appeal is made from man's eyes to mine. I sit and see another poor weak trembling human wretch pushed by his fellows, who pretend the right, up to the gulf which, where I gaze, begins from this world to the next, gives way and way, just on the edge over the awful dark, with nothing to arrest him but my feet. Guido, he says, catches at me with convulsive force, and cries for leave to live the natural minute more. To this his enemies reply, Leave? None. Put him to death. Punish him now. He, the solitary judge, must either save the wretch, or let him drift to the fall. He dallies with the thought, as if reprieve were possible for both prisoner and pope, but he knows this is a mere delusion. The case is over, judgment at an end, and all things done now and irrevocable. A mere dead man is Franceschini here, even as Formosus centuries ago. All the evidence, the Pope tells us, has been read and weighed, and the essential facts evolved, and he simply pauses before he acts. Irresolute? Not I, more than the mound with the pine trees on it yonder. Nor does his sense of fallibility deter him, for he says, Call ignorance my sorrow, not my sin. If, in some after-time, someone, by deeper probing into the mass of facts, should find Guido innocent, he declares, I shall face Guido's ghost, nor blanch a jot. God, he knows, has given him so much, no more, of reasoning faculty, and he is responsible only for the best possible use of it. Indeed, he feels more guilty for discharging a chaplain, for no cause save that he snuffled when he said Mass, than he will if he should make a mistake as to Guido's guilt. For God judges not the result of our acts, but the motives which prompted them. Therefore I stand on my integrity, nor fear at all. But, as the day closes, he knows the two names now snap and flash from mouth to mouth, Guido's and his own. Which of the two will live the longer? He might dip in Virgil, or, better still, consult the sagacious Swede who finds by figures how the chances prove to answer the question. Take the latter. Tell him the condition of the two men. Here is Guido, doomed to death, it is true, but who, like hundreds of others, may escape. He is full of strength, noble, backed by nobler friends, and the community is in sympathy with him. Such an one may bribe the jailer, or break jail, or be rescued by his friends. The other man, himself, is eighty-six years old, one who bears all the world's cark and care. A straw swallowed in his posset, or a stool over which he might stumble, may end his life at any moment. Which of the two will live the longer? 
does the Swede say that Guido will? Then he is wrong. Today is Guido's last. My term is yet to run. But suppose the Swede were right. Then how shall he, the Pope, answer for this last act of his before the judge of all? He will not answer that question in words, for words hide more truth than they show. Nor will he answer as Pope. He will answer as Antonio Pignatelli. Thou, not Pope, but the mere old man of the world, supposed inquisitive and dispassionate, wilt thou, the one whose speech I somewhat trust, question thee after me, this self, now Pope, hear his procedure, criticise his work? The second part contains the judgment which, as Antonio Pignatelli, he passes upon all the characters in the poem, and first upon Guido. The Pope recalls the conditions of his life and declares that he has a sound frame and a solid intellect. He has had, indeed, to struggle with the temptations incidental to the lot of one who, born with an appetite, lacks food. But these need not have proved so much a stumbling block as a stepping stone. To help him, he had a traditionary name, choice companionship, and conversancy with the faith. But he has used the church to aid his selfish purpose. He is a religious parasite and accepts sacred duties to avoid the consequences of his iniquity. The honourable name he bears does not enlarge his nature. He grows more unworthy of it. He seeks not to live up to it, but to live by it. Test him by his last act, the marriage, and in it can be seen that not one permissible impulse moves the man from the mere liking of the eye and ear to the true longing of the heart that loves. No trace of these, but all to instigate is what sinks man past level of the brute whose appetite, if brutish, is a truth. All is the lust for money. He then reviews his course of conduct towards the Comparini and Pompilia, and shows how he tried to drive his wife to ruin, and how, when that failed, he devised the letters, false beyond all forgery, not just handwriting and mere authorship, but false to body and soul they figure forth, as though the man had cut out shape and shape from fancies of that other aretine to paste below, incorporate the filth with cherub faces on a missal page. Caponsacchi's intervention saved him from crime, and the courts, by their decision, did the same service for him. The way was now open for him to escape from his past, though as by fire. But, the Pope says, Guido refused to learn his lesson. The birth of his son taught him only a new way to get money. All that he could see was the gold in his curls, and that, if Pietro and Violante and Pompilia were out of the way, the money would belong to the child, and the child would be in his keeping. Knowing this, he called four peasant labourers, and with them went to Rome to commit the profitable crime. Everything seemed to conspire to favour his purpose, and he might have escaped from Roman territory and laughed in Arezzo at its officials if he had not forgotten to secure the permit, to be had for the asking, to hire a conveyance. Perhaps, the Pope thinks, he cursed his omission, and yet it was the mercy stroke that stopped the fate, for his companions had planned to murder him because he had not paid them, and would have done so, had they not been arrested before they could carry out their purpose. The Pope then depicts some of the minor characters of the poem. Of the Abate Paolo, the older brother of Guido, he says, This fox-faced horrible priest, this brother brute, who trims the midnight lamp and turns the classic page, and all for craft, all to work harm with, yet incur no scratch. He refers to Girolamo, the younger brother, as one in whom he discerns a new distinctive touch, nor wolf, nor fox, but hybrid. Words seem too feeble 
who described the mother of Guido, unmotherly mother and unwomanly woman, that near turns motherhood to shame, womanliness to loathing. And he calls the four companions these God-abandoned wretched lumps of life. Then we have the Pope's opinion of the governor and of the archbishop. With the former he can do nothing, but of the archbishop he says, significantly, with thee at least anon the little word. The Pope's impression of Pompilia follows in one of the noblest and most beautiful passages of the whole poem. First of the first, such I pronounce Pompilia, then as now, perfect in whiteness. Stoop thou down, my child, give one good moment to the poor old Pope, heart sick at having all his world to blame. Let me look at thee in the flesh as erst, let me enjoy the old clean linen garb, not the new splendid vesture. Armed and crowned, would Michael yonder be, nor crowned, nor armed, the less preeminent angel? Everywhere I see in the world the intellect of man, that sword, the energy his subtle spear, the knowledge which defends him like a shield. Everywhere. But they make not up, I think, the marvel of a soul like thine, earth's flower she holds up to the softened gaze of God. It was not given Pompilia to know much, speak much, to write a book, to move mankind, be memorised by who records my time. Yet if in purity and patience, if in faith held fast, despite the plucking fiend, safe like the signet stone with the new name that saints are known by, if in right returned for wrong, most pardon for worst injury, if there be any virtue, any praise, then will this woman child have proved, who knows, just the one prize vouchsafed unworthy me, seven years a gardener of the untoward ground I till. This earth, my sweat and blood manure all the long day that barrenly grows dusk. At least one blossom makes me proud at eve, born mid the briars of my enclosure. Still, oh, here as elsewhere, nothingness of man. Those be the plants, embedded yonder south, to mellow in the morning, those made fat by the master's eye, that yield such timid leaf, uncertain bud, as product of his pains. While, see how this mere chance-sown, cleft-nursed seed, that sprang up by the wayside neath the foot of the enemy, this breaks all into blaze, spreads itself, one wide glory of desire to incorporate the whole great sun it loves from the inch height whence it looks and longs. My flower, my rose, I gather for the breast of God, this I praise most in thee, where all I praise, that, having been obedient to the end, according to the light allotted, law prescribed thy life, still tried, still standing test, dutiful to the foolish parents first, submissive next to the bad husband, nay, tolerant of those meaner, miserable, that did his hests, eked out the dole of pain, thou, patient thus, couldst rise from law to law, the old to the new, promoted at one cry, of the trump of God to the new service, not to longer bear, but henceforth fight, be found sublime in new impatience with the foe. Endure man, and obey God. Plant firm foot on neck of man, tread man into the hell meet for him, and obey God all the more. Go past me, and get thy praise, and be not far to seek presently when I follow, if I may. Next to Pompilia, the Pope approves Caponsacchi. He calls him my warrior priest, and irregular noble scapegrace, son the same. Perhaps the church had been faulty in attempting to subject such a nature as his to its service. All the qualities he had shown were not given him by the church, 
but belonged to him already. He finds much that was blameworthy in Caponsacchi, in this youth prolonged, though age was ripe, but he prefers to dwell upon the healthy rage, when the first moan broke from the martyr maid. There may, he thinks, have been much rashness shown, but he thanks God for the outcome. Ay, such championship of God at first blush, such prompt cheery thud of glove on ground that answers ringingly the challenge of the false knight. Watch we long and wait we vainly for its gallant like from those appointed to the service. He believes that throughout all his warfare he was pure, and that the greatness of his temptation had served to reveal in him what was worthy of praise. He had done the duty which those who were trained for it failed to do, because they were, somehow, too obtuse of ear through iteration of command, for catching quick the sense of the real cry. Thou, whose sword hand was used to strike the lute, whose sentry station graced some wanton's gate, thou didst push forward and show metal, shame the laggards, and retrieve the day. Well done! Be glad thou hast let light into the world, through that irregular breach of the boundary. See the same upon thy path, and march assured, learning anew the use of soldiership, self-abnegation, freedom from all fear, loyalty to the life's end. Ruminate, deserve the initiatory spasm. Once more work, be unhappy, but bear life, my son. Last of all, the Pope refers to the Comparini as starved samples of humanity, foul and fair, sadly mixed natures, and so they suffer, life's business being just the terrible choice. We might well suppose now that all was over and done with. Not so, our Pope. He is only beginning. He asks the question, upon what do these judgments of mine rest? What light have I from the upper sky to guide me? The meditation upon this forms the third part of the Pope, and extends from line 1284 to line 1954. He believes that he himself reflects something of the light of God, that his poor spark had for its source the sun. He has, in the Christian revelation, a tale of God which his heart loves and his reason approves. It satisfies the demand of his nature for love in God, as nothing else does or can. There may, indeed, be errors in the transmission of the gospel story, but these do not concern him. The same truth may be revealed under various forms. Nor does the experience of Pompilia, who suffers in her innocence, and who, by what seems an accident, barely escapes moral condemnation, disturb his faith. This life is short, and the future may serve to right the wrong. Nor, again, does it seriously trouble him that some reject Christianity. Life is probation, and there could be no test of our natures if we were arbitrarily compelled to believe, if there were no possibility of doubt. What really troubles him is that men who accept the truth do so little with it. This Aretine Archbishop, to whom Pompilia cried, Protect me from the fiend, would not do so, because he feared Guido, and he threw her back to him as a bone to mumble. Have we misjudged here, over-armed our knight, given gold and silk where plain hard steel serves best, enfeebled, whom we sought to fortify, made an Archbishop, and undone a saint? The monk is one whose prayers and fastings may be supposed to have rendered him superior to the fear of the world. To him, Pompilia came with her story of sorrow, but at the thought of doing anything displeasing to those above him, he shuddered to the marrow and ended by saying, I break my promise, let her break her heart. And here is the monastery called of Convertites meant to help women because these helped Christ. They had cared for Pompilia and had borne witness to her pure life and saintly dying days. 
she dies and lo who seemed so poor proves rich what does the body that lives through helpfulness to women for christ's sake the kiss turns bite the dove's note changes to the crow's cry judge seeing that this our convent claims of right what goods belong to those we succour be the same proved women of dishonest life and seeing that this trial made appear pompilia was in such predicament the convent hereupon pretends to said succession of pompilia issues writ and takes possession by the fisc's advice such is their attestation to the cause of christ who had one saint at least they hoped but is a title deed to filch a corpse to slander and an infant heir to cheat christ must give up his gains then they unsay all the fine speeches who was saint his whore can it be this is end and outcome all i take with me to show a stewardship's fruit the best yield of the latest time this year the seventeen hundredth since god died for man is such effect proportionate to cause and the terror increases he says when he sees that men do as well on natural as they do on supernatural reasons caponsacchi responds to the call of oppressed innocence but where are the christians in their panoply slunk into corners at this there will be a protest from those who claim that they have left their martyr mark everywhere true but they have worked no greater deeds than others have done at an instinct of the natural man immolate body sacrifice soul too do not these publicans the same there is zeal and earnestness but they are about things far off like the excitement about the proper term for deity in chinese but where is the gloriously decisive change metamorphosis the immeasurable of human clay to divine gold we looked should in some poor sort justify its price if a member of the order of the rosicrucians could make no more gold by his mystical processes than the vulgar got by the old smelting process would not we start if this were sad to see in just the sage who should profess so much perform no more what is it when suspected in that power who undertook to make and made the world devised and did effect man body and soul ordained salvation for them both and yet well is the thing we see salvation but he himself has faith and even his doubts have their value the weakness in a faith may be the source of its strength so he concludes I have light nor fear the dark at all. Euripides might claim that he, when the third poet's tread surprised the two, whose lot fell in a land where life was great, and sense went free, and beauty lay profuse, I, untouched by one adverse circumstance, adopted virtue as my rule of life, waived all reward, loved but for loving's sake, and, what my heart taught me, I taught the world, and have been teaching now two thousand years. Why, Euripides might ask, should he be blamed, when he attained so long ago, to what men fail now to see, even in the full blaze of the Christian revelation? How shall he answer Euripides? May it not be that our truth has become so true, so much a part of the order of the world, that it no longer requires purity of soul to perceive it, a heroic courage to maintain it faith may have become so easy that the most ordinary motives lead men to adopt it this old faith may need to be broken up in order to resolve itself into a new and living faith may not the coming age correct the portrait by the living face man's god by god's god in the mind of man but such an age must be one of trial and terror Many will sink in the ocean of doubt. Some, like Pompilia, will do what is right and true just the same. They will distinguish the right by foot-feel. Others will say, follow your heart as I did mine. 
This was the way of Caponsacchi, and it was well, for his heart was right. But the Abate, and those like him, may say, My heart beats to another tune, and live for greed, ambition, lust, revenge. The Pope now imagines that he hears the remonstrances made in Guido's favour, made not in the name of mercy, but of what is called honour. They urge that he need give no reason for a decision in his behalf, except that even minor orders in the church secure one from punishment. He may claim to acquit Guido in the interest of the church, or he may say that culture, the spirit of civilization, demands his pardon. Does he wish, they urge, to end his days condemning a man to death? Will he have it said, as soon as he is dead, Scarce the three little taps of the silver mallet ended on thy brow, his last act was to sacrifice a count, and thereby screen a scandal of the church? He hears the voices that demand judgment, and cry, Pronounce then, for our breath and patience fail. To these, the Pope replies, I will, sirs, but a voice other than yours quickens my spirit. Quis pro domino? Who is upon the Lord's side? asked the Count. I, who write, on receipt of this command, acquaint Count Guido and his fellows for, they die tomorrow. Could it be tonight, the better, for the work to do takes time. Set with all diligence a scaffold up, not in the customary place by Bridge St. Angelo, where die the common sort, but since the man is noble, and his peers, by predilection, haunt the people's square, there let him be beheaded in the midst, and his companions hanged on either side. So shall the quality see, fear, and learn. All which work takes time. Till tomorrow, then, let there be prayer incessant for the five. For the main criminal, I have no hope, except in such a suddenness of fate. I stood at Naples once, a night so dark, I could have scarce conjectured there was earth anywhere, sky or sea, or world at all. But the night's black was burst through by a blaze. Thunder struck blow on blow, earth groaned and bore, through her whole length of mountain visible. There lay the city, thick and plain with spires, and, like a ghost shrouded, white the sea. So may the truth be flashed out by one blow, and Guido see one instant, and be saved. Else I avert my face, nor follow him into that sad, obscure, sequestered state, where God unmakes but to remake the soul he else made first in vain, which must not be. Enough, for I may die this very night, and how should I dare die this man let live? The Pope is called upon to accept or reject the plea of Guido, that because he was in orders, he was entitled to exemption from the penalty imposed by the court. It is in his power to set Guido free, or to send him to the scaffold. The decision of such a case, which actually required only the consideration of a few minutes, occupied hours in the poem. The Pope is an old man of eighty-six, whose life the slightest circumstance might terminate. He wishes to judge this case as if it were his last, and as if his whole life were to be estimated in the light of it. His reading of history has taught him how the estimates of man change from generation to generation. One blames, another praises the same act. How will men regard this last judgment of his? It is not enough for him that he is the head of the church. He will not fall back upon any official excuse for his decision. Antonio Pignatelli, the mere old man of the world, supposed inquisitive and dispassionate, must judge what is done by the Pope. He has looked into this case, has poured over all the documents and pleadings of the lawyers, and has arrived at a conclusion. Till he ponders, and again brings before his mind the persons involved in the murder case. He praises and blames in a way that shows that long experience of life has taught him 
to read the heart of man, and the reader feels that he has said the last word in the matter. He goes beyond this and seeks to test the reality of the moral and spiritual ideas on which his decision rests. In and through his long meditation, he impresses us as a man of profound conscientiousness, whose opinions were always based upon first-hand knowledge and the deepest reflection. He also reveals himself as a man capable of moral indignation. We feel it throbbing through his review of the career and character of Guido, and of his mother and brothers. In it all there is clearly perceptible a hatred of shams, and cruelty and greed. He has no patience with the convertite nuns who seek to gain money by the vilification of Pompilia who had been entrusted to their care, and we know it will go hard with the archbishop when he speaks to him anon the little word. But along with his hatred of the wrong go his perception and approval of the good. His whole nature is stirred by the character of Pompilia. He sees in her a revelation of the highest form of humanity. He knows a beautiful soul when he sees it. It might have been expected that he would condemn Caponsacchi, but while he discerns the technical offence of the priest, he still more clearly perceives the real character and motive of the man. To him, the impulse of helpfulness was much more important than the violation of priestly etiquette, and the sacrifice of reputation in defence of a woman in peril was worth more than the formal correctness of those who had neglected her appeals. The public, and even the judges of the court who tried Caponsacchi, did not believe his direct and simple statement. To them it was only a story cleverly told on his own behalf. But the Pope recognises its genuineness and says, In thought, word and deed, how throughout all thy warfare thou wast pure, I find it easy to believe. The Pope has what is rarer than conscientiousness, or moral indignation, or perception of reality. He has spiritual courage. Many men have doubts and questionings about the deepest faiths of their souls, but few have the courage to face them resolutely, as does the Pope. Usually they turn their thoughts away from the facts that disturb the repose of their minds and hearts. They are afraid to examine the foundations on which their faith rests. They turn aside from the fact that many acknowledge Christianity and yet act as if they had never heard of it. Still less are they ready to ask themselves why many who never heard of Christianity shame its adherence by their conduct and character. They never venture to ask why it is that the deeds prompted by natural instinct are as great and noble as those inspired by Christian faith. These are just the questions which the Pope faces. He will not hide them from sight. He meets them not as a doubter, but as a man whose faith is deeper and stronger than his questionings. He is a man of faith because he has the courage to doubt. His courage goes beyond this. It is clear to him that the old faith is now so easily accepted that it exerts little influence on the practical life. Perhaps, as a result of this, it may be well to break up the long-established and customary order of thought and belief. He shudders at the thought because he sees that many would do worse than they do now if the usual standards should be removed. Some, like Pompilia, might know the right way by the foot-feel, and others might follow the guidance of their higher nature, like Caponsacchi. But how about those who trust to what is lower in themselves and follow it? like Guido and his brothers. Yet, in spite of all his forebodings, he has the courage to believe that even the dissolution of the old order would result, at last, in the establishment of one that would better serve the higher interests of humanity. There is not in all literature and history a nobler example of spiritual courage than this. Then our Pope is independent of all external influences. The suggestion that he may be mistaken in his judgment of Guido, and that later knowledge may show him as really innocent, does not deter him. He knows his integrity, and stands securely upon that. Ignorance is his sorrow, not his sin. He knows that he has done his best, and has acted upon a worthy motive, 
and for him that is enough. Nothing offends him more than the intimation that people will criticise his action. This only serves to precipitate his final decision. When the friends of Guido are represented as addressing him and appealing to him on the ground that after he has gone, it will be said that his last act was to sacrifice a count and thereby screen a scandal of the church. When they urge him to pronounce his decision because their breath and patience fail, he does so in a way altogether different from what they had anticipated. I will, sirs, but a voice other than yours quickens my spirit. Quis pro domino? Who is upon the Lord's side? asked the Count. I who write. On receipt of this command, acquaint Count Guido and his fellows for, they die tomorrow. Could it be tonight, the better, but the work to do takes time. End of chapter 11section twelve of the ring and the book an interpretation by francis bickford hornbrook this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve guido we have once before heard guido speaking in his own defence before the court and using all his skill and craft to save his life now we hear him after the trial is over and after the Pope has refused to revoke the sentence against him. He is in his prison cell, where his old-time friends, Cardinal Acciuoli and Abate Panciticchi, have come to notify him of his impending doom, and to hear his confession. In their presence he pours out, without much order or premeditation, all the thoughts and feelings that possess him. He recalls the place, where the castle of the cardinal's predecessor was situated, and then breaks forth into an appeal for help, urging that his blood comes from as far a source. Perhaps, after all, their coming is simply a trick on their part to test his courage, but, he declares, he is calm as he hears them, knowing that he is innocent. All honest Rome had approved his part. His lawyers had assured him that on account of his priestly tonsure he could depend upon the intervention of the Pope, so meek and mild and merciful. But the Pope had refused the chance to save him. He is old himself, tired of life, and so is glad to have him die. Again Guido turns to his friends and cries, Sir Abate, can you do nothing? Things have changed so much since the days of his grandfather, who stabbed the man who merely threw a gibe at him as he passed by, and was never called to account for it. Now he does the same thing, and death is the penalty. The abate and cardinal must hear him talk, others will hear him at pleasant supper time. Then he exclaims, Life! How I could spill this overplus of mine! Among those hoar-haired, shrunk-shanked odds and ends, Of body and soul, old age is chewing dry. Those windle-straws that stare, While purblind death mows here, mows there, Makes hay of juicy me, And misses just the bunch of withered weed, Would frighten hell, and streak its smoke with flame. How the life I could shed, yet never shrink, would drench their stalks with sap like grass in May. Is it not terrible? I entreat you, sirs. With manifold and plentitudinous life, prompt at death's menace to give blow for threat, answer his, Be thou not, by, Thus I am. Terrible so to be alive, yet die. Now, he continues, he sees things clearly, his folly consisted in thinking he needed a wife, when what he seemed to lack was already within himself. But while he talks, he allows himself to wander to the contemplation of the Manaya which he had seen, in all its ghastliness, many a good year gone, just after it had decapitated a man who had struck a nobleman for taking away his sister. 
the pope will not be merciful as he ought and so they now want his confession why do they want it well because they wish to prevent people from imputing bad motives to the pope they want him to end the edifying way but he will end telling the truth he is a wolf and of course the shepherds must hate him but that is no reason why the wolf should lick the prong that spits him why should he repent to do so will not save him from death he is about to die and so he will out with the truth and ask no respite he has opposed himself to the regular order of things he has fenced with the law and law has thrust him through and made an end of him but they want him to acknowledge that virtue alone disarmed and slew him law does not suffice they seek a word from him which shall somehow put the keystone in its place and crown the arch to this guido says then take the word you want long ago it was agreed that a man must not commit extra legal acts because they pleased himself and that whosoever did must pay the forfeit he has broken this compact and loses his head but repentance too but pure and simple sorrow for law's breach rather than blunderer's ineptitude cardinal no abate scarcely thus tis the fault not that i dared try a fall with law and straightway am found underboast but that i failed to see above man's law god's precept you the christians recognize Holly, my cow don't fidget cardinal abate cross your breast and count your beads and exorcise the devil for here he stands and stiffens in the bristly nape of neck daring you drive him hence if ever there was such a thing as christian faith it has vanished long ago it is no longer a reality in the world once perhaps it affected conduct but it does so no more everybody does as he would do if he believed just the reverse of what christianity teaches why should things change because men disbelieve what's incompatible in the whited tomb with bones and rottenness one inch below what saintly act is done in rome today but might be prompted by the devil is i say not has been and again may be i do say full in the face of the crucifix you try to stop my mouth with as for his friends what had they taught him they told him to get pleasure but they never warned him of the consequences of pursuing it no word of warning ever fell from their lips instead of that they as good as told him to wear the sheep's wool over the wolf's skin but now when a wolf has shown his teeth too much they join with those who seek his destruction if he were only free once more they would get a growl for their beckoning why do people call his defence plausible but false when plausibility is the only reason they can give in favour of the best belief they hold he had told his story of the flight of his wife with the priest and how they took their pleasure in the two days flight and people call it incredible but why the story might seem credible to the husband at least men are often blamed for not perceiving the misconduct of their wives why should he be blamed for suspecting wrong when in fact there was none presently however guido asks what shall i say to god this if i find the tongue and keep the mind do thou wipe out the being of me and smear this soul from off thy white of things i blot i am one huge and sheer mistake whose fault not mine at least who did not make myself he declares that he is unable to repent one particle of the past and longs for some cold wise man who might go into the depths of his being see how he came to commit this blunder which others call a crime and pronounce on his desert with reason he was at the turning of the roads where did he take the first false step he remembers pompilia 
who seems to stand before him now as she stood for the first time with the amazed look all one insuppressive prayer might she but breathe set free as heretofore have this cup leave her lips unblistered bear any cross any whither any how so but alone so but apart from me you are touched so am i quite otherwise if tis with pity i resent my wrong being a man he was old and the whole attitude of pompilia showed her aversion to him her mother tried to persuade him that by taking a little pains with himself he might appear even better to her than a boy but that deceived only for a moment the man who saw that her neck writhed corded itself against his kiss and that her hand was rigid with despair when he clasped it all this he resented because he was young in soul so he claims pompilia began by wronging him and he hated her at the marriage she came knelt rose spoke and was silent just as she was bid and this also he resented she did all and submitted to his will simply because her mother bade her there might have been some compensation in revolt but there was none in this predetermined saintship people he says told him that he must teach the child to love to endure him he must be contented they said with friendship even as young lovers are when they have kissed themselves cold but he did not wish to miss the daisied mile the course begins with his wife was really no wife but a nullity in female shape who was soon to become a pungent plague when associated with the aged couple pietro and violante he does not see what these two had to complain of him they had meant to fool him and he had fooled them instead of taking their punishment quietly they kept up a perfect goose-yard cackle of complaint because i do not gild the geese their oats he turned them out and was just beginning to enjoy the sweet sudden silence all about when he found my dowry was derision my gain muck my wife the church declared my flesh and blood the nameless bastard of a common whore my old name turned henceforth to shall i say he that received the ordure in his face guido reminds the abate of his punishment of a man who had written an abusive poem about himself and asks how he can think he has taken undue revenge upon the parents of pompilia who had circled me buzzed me deaf and stung me blind and stunk me dead with fetter in the face until i stopped the nuisance but they may urge that pompilia was innocent and if so he had no reason for murdering her it is true she did just as he bade her she sits up she lies down she comes and goes kneels at the couch side overleans the sill of the window cold and pale and mute as stone strong as stone also she annoyed him all the more that she made no resistance to his wishes and desires there must be some reason for it all is there no third party to the pact who is the friend in the background that notes all who may come presently and close accounts this self-possession to the uttermost how does it differ in aught save degree from the terrible patience of god but his friends will say to him all this only means she did not love you what of that the servants do not love him but no less they render what he desires the horse admonished by the whip fulfils the will of his master if a woman can feel no love let her show the more why the soprano who sang last week in rome for two gold zecchines the evening made love in such a way that ladies swooned although the poor bloodless creature never felt he is my slave whose body and soul depend upon my nod can't falter out the first note in the scale for her life why blame me if i take the life 
but there is no necessity for defending his deed. It is enough for him to say that he chose to hate her. Others have their likes and dislikes. Why not he? True, he might have turned the marriage to better account. It is easy to say that now, but he has taken the wrong step which is to end with the scaffold. Give him another chance and he will do better. These religious guides had all his life taught him to suppress himself, which really meant denial of himself to pleasure them. Now he had avenged an outrage committed on himself in a way that they blamed. But they ought to blame themselves. His wife proved a stumbling block in his way. He had resorted to law, but to no purpose. Then he had acted for himself in the spirit of the law. If things had gone at the inn, as he had expected, and if he had surprised the runaways asleep and pinned them through, even they would have agreed that it was a just judgment upon the guilty ones. But somehow matters did not turn out so. What might have been a success turned out a failure. His act, which might have been gravely, grandly right, now proved to be grossly wrong. So it was in his last act at the villa. As he marched towards it with his four companions, he thought everything had been so far successful and wondered where he should find the failure. Only two of the three might be within, or perhaps some visitor, out lingering others, might make an outcry. But all three were within, and no one else. But he found the three alone, as he hoped, and his failure came in his forgetfulness to secure the permit beforehand which would have given him the right to hire a conveyance to carry him away from the city. What was more, the only man in Rome who could not be bribed was the one to whom he applied. Otherwise he could have snapped his fingers at the Roman courts and found refuge in Tuscany, where the laws understand civilised life and do its champions right. All that might have been was balked by just a scrupulous knave. When he was brought back to Rome, he found his wife, riddled with wounds, still living to confront him, and by her deathbed story to turn his plausibility to nothingness. When destiny intends you cards like these, what good of skill and preconcerted play? If she had been dead, Guido thinks he could have claimed that he had come to Rome to see his child, and, fearing danger, had taken four companions for protection, but had come unexpectedly to the villa to find Pompilia in the embrace of the priest. These two, backed by Pietro and Violante, had sprung upon him, he would have said, and, in defence of his life, he was compelled to slay them all, except the priest, who had escaped. What's disputable, refutable here, save by just this one ghost thing half on earth, half out of it, as if she held God's hand while she leant back and looked her last at me, forgiving me, here monks begin to weep, oh, from her very soul, commending mine to heavenly mercies, which are infinite, while fixing fast my head beneath your knife. Tis fate, not fortune. He learns that his four companions were cherishing a scheme to cut his throat for their own benefit, and he rejoices that he is to be executed last, and so will be able to behold them all dangling high on either hand like scarecrows in a hemp field. Guido then comes back to his trial, in which his lawyers tried every device in vain. Everything had been against him. The appeal to the Pope was useless. Law had condemned him, while the Pope merely bade him confess and be absolved. Well, they may tell His Holiness that he has acquired new strength from his despair. He will give earth spectacle of a brave fighter who succumbs to odds that turn defeat to victory. He will end his life, and Rome will approve him as much as if he had died on the field of battle fighting against the Turks. There is no reason why he should live longer. The popular sympathy would fail him the moment he became free. His friends would not care to be seen in his company. At his home, in Arezzo, the coming years would be sad and sapless. 
the priests would leer at him his friends would look askance the populace would be in love with the poor young good beauteous murdered wife his brothers would remind him of his past mistake whenever he became angry or attempted to give them advice even his mother would groan confirmation of his failure besides he is fifty years old and there are no new openings before him he might renew his youth in his son but he would have to wait twenty years for him to share life with him then the son is apt to crowd his father to one side even if he were obedient and all that one can hire service just as good the four young fellows he says did my hest as unreluctantly a promise of a dollar as a son adjured by mumping memories of the past why then should he wish to live when all the means of life are lacking and now that he is about to die he will speak out the truth he never was a christian he is a primitive religionist he has obeyed the specific commands of christianity but in everything outside of these he has reverted to his own natural impulses he intimates that his companions are of the same way of thinking no one he says to the abate teaches you what venus means we give alms prescribed on friday but there is no explicit word in the book which debars revenge because the foe is prostrate the old faith of the primitive religionist obedience to impulse can exist under the new forms all that is needed is the sin of the sly he claims that he has followed the logic of his position i like the rest wrote poison on my bread but broke and ate said those that use the sword shall perish by the same then stabbed my foe what his friends ought to say to him if they had the wit is that he had merely pursued the wrong method so that while loving life as much as he did they were compelled to punish him he should first of all have put forth the religious motive at rome and claimed that he meant to prevent his child from being reared as a molinist true pietro and violante were not molinists but he had only made the mistake of stamping on wheat when he meant to trample tares now the mistake can be atoned for only by death which indeed may be a new beginning he proposes when he begins anew to carry out his wolfish nature to wallow in what is now a wolfishness coerced too much by the humanity that's half of me as well grow out of man glut the wolf nature through all obstacles he wishes his real instinct to reveal itself as fire at the top of some mountain his wife was of an altogether different nature and for that reason was hateful to him i of the water that was that wife of mine be it for good be it for ill no run of the red thread through that insignificance again how she is at me with those eyes away with the empty stare be wholly still and stupid ever occupy your patch of private snow that's somewhere in what world may now be growing icy round your head and aguish at your footprint freeze not me dare follow not another step i take not with so much as those detested eyes no though they follow but to pray me pause on the incline earth's edge that's next to hell none of your abnegation of revenge fly at me frank tug while i tear again there's god go tell him testify your worst not she there was no touch in her of hate and it would prove her hell if i reached mine to know i suffered would still sadden her do what the angels might to make amends guido knows it will be said that others would have loved her for her saintliness and that he did not know the value of a woman like pompilia what had seemed to him a daub was a raphael to this he replies that she was too pale and spectral for him he could have borne with her if she had come to him rainbowed about with riches he is not ashamed to allow that he prizes sordid muck as the best gift 
He wants a woman who will work out his will, one like Lucrezia Borgia, and again he repels the religious ministrations of his friends. Cardinal, take away your crucifix. Abate, leave my lips alone. They bite. Vainly you try to change what should not change, and shall not. I have bared, you bathe my heart. It grows the stonier for your saving dew. You steep the substance, you would lubricate in waters that but touch to petrify. He tells his friends that they too are petrifactions of a kind. He has unfolded his story, and they move not a muscle, show no mercy, ready to slay impenitence without waiting for contrition. The cardinal knows he is wronged. No one made inquisition for the cardinal's blood when he made his way through lives trodden into dust into the college. He is not even troubled by the memory of it. So he treads out the lives of happy, innocent things as he moves to dinner and kills the damsel fly that flaps his face. Why, then, because he himself has taken his own course, must the Pope kill him? He insinuates to the Cardinal that, in the election of a Pope, which must occur soon, he can be of great service in getting rivals out of the way. He adjures his friend to go to the Pope and urge his pardon, because he is innocent, or, even if murder crusted, his death would insult the Emperor and outrage the French King. He must remind the Pope, too, that Guido has friends who will avenge him, and ask him if he would send a soul straight to perdition, dying Frank, an atheist. In one breath, Guido urges the Cardinal, for God's sake, to say this, and in another, he abandons all hope that he will do so. If he cannot persuade them to do as he wishes, he will not make a confession. Take your crucifix away, I tell you twice. There follows a silence so prolonged, while the priests are praying, that it seems to terrify Guido, and he breaks forth again to assert the essential wolfishness of his nature, that loves to know, even at the last, that it is inflicting some pang. When the knock comes, he assures them, he will not cling to his bench, nor flee the hangman's face. After all, what is the worth of life? The Pope is dead, the Abate will not live more than a year with that hacking cough of his, the Cardinal can never become Pope. All about him are moving on toward death. What can it matter that he arrives a minute sooner than the others? As for the manner of it, he counts it gain that his death will be harsh and quick. The whole man, at his best and worst, comes out in the closing lines. You never know what life means till you die. Even throughout life, it is death that makes life live, gives it whatever the significance. For see, on your own ground and argument, supposing life had no death to fear, how find a possibility of nobleness in man, prevented daring any more? What's love, what's faith, without a worst to dread? Lack lustre jewellery, but faith and love with death behind them, bidding do or die. Put such a foil at back, the sparkle's born. From out myself, how the strange colours come. Is there a new rule in another world? Be sure I shall resign myself as here I recognised no law I could not see, there, what I see, I shall acknowledge too. On earth I never took the Pope for God, in heaven I shall scarce take God for the Pope. Unmanned, remanned. I hold it probable, with something changeless at the heart of me to know me by, some nucleus that's myself. Accretions did it wrong? Away with them, you soon shall see the use of fire. Till when, all that was, is, and must for ever be. Nor is it in me to unhate my hates. I use at my last strength to strike once more old Pietro in the winehouse gossip face, to trample underfoot the wine and wile of beast violante and I grow one gorge to loathingly reject Pompilia's pale poison 
my hasty hunger took for food a strong tree wants no wreaths about its trunk no cloying cups no sickly sweet of scent but sustenance at root a bucketful how else lived that athenian who died so drinking hot bull's blood fit for men like me i lived and died a man and take man's chance honest and bold right will be done to such who are these you have let descend my stair ha their accursed psalm lights at the sill is it open they dare bid you treachery sirs have i spoken one word all this while out of the world of words i had to say not one word all was folly i laughed and mocked sirs my first true word all truth and no lie is save me notwithstanding life is all i was just stark mad let the madman live pressed by as many chains as you please pile don't open hold me from them i am yours i am the grand duke's no i am the pope's abate cardinal christ maria god pompilia will you let them murder me count guido franceschini expressed himself before his judges as he wished to be understood but in his second review of the story we have the real man who discloses his motives and desires here we are allowed to see him as he who reads the secrets of men's hearts sees him he is no longer mindful of the social and religious conventions what he utters expresses his real nature it is not the count but the man who speaks now no concealment is needed and he attempts none he lets us see the evil of his soul unmixed with any thought of good mr hyde is now left without the influence of dr jekyll to rightly appreciate this we must bear in mind that it is the utterance of a man excited maddened overwhelmed who does not plan what he says but who allows his mind to wander at will his speech is the expression of pure passion as the pope's is the expression of pure reason in it we discover how much pretence there was in the defence one of the reasons which he had given for wishing to live was his mother's need of him he cried in a way that impressed us let her come break her heart upon my breast not on the blank stone of my nameless tomb but in this last utterance he has no word to say about her except that she will give confirmatory groan for unsuccess explain it how you will we may justify this by reference to the excitement of the moment but love does not so easily forget we cannot help feeling that guido remembered his mother only when he thought he could produce a pathetic impression by it again he said in his defence of himself that when he came to the cottage on the night of the murder he might have abandoned his purpose if pompilia had appeared in the doorway and he spoke of her as the tender thing the lamb that lay in my bosom as once pure and good but here all these terms of endearment are missing now he speaks of her as a nullity in female shape vapid disgust soon to be pungent plague this pale poison my hasty hunger took for food in his defence he wished to live for the sake of his son gaetano he said let me lift up his youth and innocence to purify my palace but now he assures his friends that a son will be more of a hindrance than a help that after all he can hire a man for a dollar a day to do what a son would do adjured by mumping memories of the past in his defence he posed as a friend of law and order and society but in his cell he suggests to the cardinal how he may be useful to him in the impending election of a pope by putting some of his dangerous rivals out of the way of course it may be urged that in the frenzy of fear and passion he forgot himself but it is more likely that he remembered himself too well 
when it was useful to him to be a friend of law and order he was ready to be one when it was useful to him to commit an act of violence he was prepared to do that his personal interest was his only law guido's attitude toward religion was equally pretentious in his defence he used the most formal state of faith and spoke in the name of the indivisible trinity in his last hours he declares himself to be a primitive religionist one who believes in obeying the natural promptings of the human heart and in the right of the stronger he obeyed what christianity specially commands but otherwise felt free to do as he could and as he pleased give arms prescribed on friday but hold hand because your foe lies prostrate where's the word explicit in the book debars revenge he is ready to profess himself an atheist if by so doing he can escape execution we learn from the defence something of the way in which he considered his wife as one who had no right to expect love whose supreme duty was obedience to her husband but now he bears the secret motives of all his actions he was angry with pompilia because she was not all that he expected of a wife he was willing to accept beauty and purity of soul if he could have also either wealth or an efficiency which could aid his selfish purposes the fact is he declares that his wife was too good a lucrezia borgia or an olympia or circe would have suited him better nothing in the conduct of pompilia satisfied him did she obey him desire his love when he asked it come and go lift her eyes or cast them down at his bidding in all this he could only see the stone strength of white despair she struggled against him no more and he suspected there was some third party to the pact was he reminded that all this meant she did not love him he replied that love was not needed he had so little sense of sincerity of soul that he believed sham love would do just as well the sufferings of pompilia wakened no compassion in guido they only annoyed him he resented her evident repugnance to himself and it simply vexed him that he was viewed with repulsion selfishness could not have been more supreme guido not only resented the sufferings of pompilia when he ought to have been moved to console and alleviate them but he is sorry now because she pierced with two and twenty wounds persists in living and so makes it impossible for him to present a defence of himself at the expense of her honour no matter what becomes of her soul if only he can escape punishment it never dawns upon him that he is proposing a mean thing he is too mean to see how mean he is he complains of the misfortune which made his intention impossible well the worst's in store thus hindered hailed this way to rome again by hang-dogs whom find i here still to fight with but my pale frail wife riddled with wounds by one not like to waste the blows he dealt knowing anatomy guido refuses to show any repentance for his deed he admits he has committed a blunder and he is ready to pay the penalty but he has no perception of sin or the need of repentance for it guido's idea of religion is a merely formal one according to him it is based upon a faith which has long ago ceased to be nobody he claims thinks of acting in accordance with it the world goes on and looks the same with the profession of these forms as it would if everybody believed something different real acceptance of religion would make a change in a moment it is interesting to notice how near guido comes to the thought of the pope he also sees that men accept the christian faith and act no better than those who do not sometimes not as well the difference lies in the use which each one makes of this perception with the pope it is a reason for making religion more real and vital with guido it serves as an excuse for a heartless conformity to the religion of the land guido feels that he is no worse than those about him 
all seek their pleasure not the will of god and he has done only the same he declares that they advised him to act the wolf's part and he resents their willingness to take part against the wolf when he acts after the manner of a wolf he claims that he acted upon the principles of those whom he was taught to follow he reminds the abate of the punishment he had inflicted upon one who had ridiculed him in a poem he himself has done only the same to those who offended him his purpose was no worse than that of others who pretend to deprecate his crime to guido law was not an expression of eternal right it was but a formal convention which was good if it favoured him bad if it opposed him whatever the code allowed him to do that it seemed to him right to do guido's excuses for himself are significant he will in the first place say to god i am one huge and sheer mistake who shall say he is not right surely one who is well organized could not pursue the ends which he pursued in the way he did the pope pointed out the places where he might have done otherwise than he did but who knows that constituted as he was he could have done so if he was a mistake he was therefore necessitated by his structure always to take the wrong course he seems repulsive to us in his self-revelation and we can well believe him when he says he has a wolfish nature guido bases his plea of forgiveness on this fact but the trouble with this plea is that it is too limited in its application he does not make this principle of forgiveness universal it never dawns upon him that pompilia was a pungent plague because in relation to him she was a mistake the wine and wile of violante annoyed him and also the stupid ways of pietro but if he had been true to his principle he would have borne with them in patience because like himself they were mistakes and therefore deserved not resentment but the large tolerance which he desired for himself that he did not accord to others what he expected for himself may be taken as a proof of what a great mistake he really was again guido says i did not make myself pompilia makes the same plea for him that fact saved guido from a great responsibility he had nothing to do with the conditions under which he was born but he had something to do with the way in which he used those conditions the pope thinks that guido might have profited by the straitened circumstances of his lot and made the stumbling block a stepping stone he might have treated pompilia with kindness instead of cruelty the birth of his son might have stirred his heart with affection instead of prompting him to see only the gold in his curls and so to the murder of his wife and her parents still guido might plead that being the man he was he must have dealt with the conditions as he did no abstract reasoning can refute this plea while no practical mind can accept it while guido has no moral perception and no sense of responsibility he is very bitter against those who in any way oppose or annoy him personal irritation supplies the lack of moral indignation his spiteful and revengeful feeling reveals itself again and again when he learns that his four companions had planned to kill him if they had escaped arrest he rejoices in the thought that he will see them hanged before his own head falls he declares that his stabs went deeper because he fancied he might find a friend's face at the bottom of each wound and scratch its smirk a little he recalls the movements of violante as tempting the sudden fist of man too much he is glad because his friend the abate must die soon of his cough and because the cardinal can never be pope it angers him because the pope who is so old and weak is likely to live longer than himself hatred of everything but himself has gained full possession of him he comforts himself with the assurance that all others must die as well as himself nor has guido the redeeming quality of courage many men who have done nothing else well have died well he shrinks with horror from death when it is imminent 
and the brothers of death come to take him to the scaffold, he is utterly unmanned. He shrieks out a mad appeal to every possible power of help to deliver him. He even calls upon the woman whom he had wronged and murdered. Bishop Westcott, whose essay on Browning's view of life is one of the noblest which even this great scholar and thinker has written, says that in this cry of Guido to Pompilia, he shows that he has known what love was, and knowing it, has begun to feel it. Who can decide what was in that last cry? It may have been a selfish appeal for help to one who, because of her goodness, might save him. Or it may have been the expression of Guido's real thought of Pompilia. But whether he now saw in her a manifestation of love, in which he wished to share, or a power which might deliver him from impending death, no one can say. We can only trust the larger hope. End of chapter 12